Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Close Up. Um, we are here for our first North American studio session. I am going to pass it over to our host, William Hanley of Dwell Magazine. Um, and please submit your questions because I will see them right here. And we um, would love to answer a couple if we have time at the end of the session. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, welcome to the first of three North American studio sessions we'll be doing over the next few days, or next two days. Um, the format for these is uh, an introduction to studios from all over the continent. I think we've got three countries represented. Um, so we'll watch a series of videos um, showing uh, each of the designers that work in their studios, get to know them, get to know their practice, and then we'll uh, move on to kind of an open Q&A. So um, let's introduce our first group uh, playing for the home team with the studio here at Industry City in Brooklyn is Ian Love. And then uh, joining us, thanks for coming. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> cool. Um, and then joining us from Mexico City, we have uh, Brenda Michelle Herrera Velez and Ana Paula Sanchez. Um, <laughs> hi, uh, from Tramarte, hi. based down there. And then finally, uh, joining us from Quebec, we have Maude Rondeau uh, from Luminaire Authentique. Authentic. Hello. Hi, Maude. Thanks so much for joining. <laughs> Where in Quebec are you? Uh, Montreal, actually. Uh, we're in, in Montreal and Eastern Township, so it's like 15 minutes. It's beautiful. It's in the country. It's amazing. That's <laughs> awesome. And uh, I know you manufacture out there as well, so we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Uh, absolutely. So as I said, um, we're going to jump into some studio visit videos just to get to know everybody and their work. Um, and Ian, I think you're first up. Love it. My name is Ian Love. My company is called Ian Love Design. I make a mixture of sculptural furniture and objects. The majority of the material that I work with is local, within about 30 miles from my house. Everything's handmade by me. Last time I did a close-up, I showed you how I made things, where they came from, and ultimately where they ended up in my showroom in Brooklyn, in Industry City. This time I want to focus on a project that I just finished which is the biggest thing I've ever done. Um, it's a combination of a 27-foot sculptural reception desk made out of a couple of whole black walnut trees and 18 pieces of furniture. So first I'm gonna show you some photos of the finished pieces and then a little bit about the process of how I made it. So I'm at my favorite place here on the North Fork called Lumber and Salt. Um, it's my favorite place to come when I need materials that I don't have. So I know when I come here, they're always gonna have something really unique and special. Um, so let me go show you around. So this is the stack of black walnut that I saw when I came. Um, and I immediately thought this might work for the front of the desk, the 27 foot run of sculpture that I had to create. Um, and the boards are, you know, they don't look like much, but once you start getting into them, it became this really gorgeous, gorgeous piece of uh, material to work with. And that's what I ended up using for the whole front part of the desk.
was making this giant desk, which is by far the biggest thing I've ever made before, I also had to make uh, all, all this furniture for this company. Um, 18 pieces, uh, 13 hand-carved side tables, all made out of single logs of wood, and five coffee tables and bar height tables. Um, so I definitely had my work cut out for me. So a great thing that happened while I was making this furniture is about half a mile down from me, there's this big oak tree that I've driven past for years, and I saw the town was cutting it down, and it was lying on the side of the road. I asked if I could have it, which I do a lot, and they said yes, which they usually say, and then I uh, ended up using a lot of that tree for the uh, carved side tables and stools that I made for, for the job. So this is a perfect example of what I try to do with as many pieces as I can. Find material that's close to me, that uh, might be thrown away or discarded in some way, and figure out a way to repurpose that and incorporate it into life or an office or somebody else's life, um, and let that material have a whole new life of its own and, and be around even longer. I'm really happy with the way all these pieces turned out, and here are some pictures of it. Thanks a lot for watching. I'm happy that I could show you how I can make things from the smallest objects to the largest with still the same amount of craftsmanship and consideration into each piece, but still be able to create that unique special feel but in a larger scale with good lead times and being able to deliver a high quality item. So thanks. Thanks, Ian. It was great to get a, a, a glance behind the scenes there. I want to talk more about that desk uh, in a little bit. Um, up next, we have uh, Brenda and Anna from Tremarte. From the designer's perspective, when you have an idea, the possibilities are endless. The challenge lies within the execution. For us, Teotitlan del Valle gave us the chance to start a new collaboration. Our creative process used to be just a two-person job where the planning and execution of our pieces were limited to the two of us. The thrilling part is how a change in the context forces you to move away from your comfort zone. That's what happened to us. When the pandemic hit, we received a message from an artisan named Aida, offering her services to produce our products.
Aida started weaving rugs when she was 12 years old. She dedicates herself to preserving ancient techniques that her community has been working with for years. Such as the use of a petal loom and natural dyes. This collaboration came with different challenges, and one of the most important ones was how could we communicate effectively in a virtual way when the process itself should be face to face? For us, design is a tool that allows us to connect a concept and the final product. The same thing happens with collaborations between designers and artisans. Each one has a different skill set that complements the other. Here is where the best results lie. By having constant feedback, we arrived at something we couldn't have imagined initially. It's a continuous process of evolution. Each piece carries a story, starting with an idea, conceptualizing it, and its execution. In Dramarte, each part of the process is carefully planned, seeking the best quality, but above all, keeping the essence of who we are. That's the reason why this collaboration is so important to us. Here, we can create pieces with an intimate meaning in a different context from our own, whilst also helping the local economy and preserving ancient traditions. Part of the process is figuring out how we can innovate using a traditional technique. In this community, they have been producing wool rocks for generations. And the products tend to be very similar. Our challenge is to maintain their traditions, but at the same time create products with a contemporary twist. Our tapestry serve this purpose, to show how we have generated new proposals and design using traditional weaving techniques. For this piece, we wanted to change the conventional horizontal format so the viewer could admire this expertly woven canvas more intimately. Having the tapestry hanging on the wall allows you to admire it more closely, see every detail, and appreciate the different textures. Unlike a rug, where you maintain a certain distance from it, our tapestry encourages contemplation and a closer interaction with the artwork. The essence of our brand is to achieve the best result through collaboration. By using cotton, wool and youth, we create pillow, rugs and wall hangings. We seek to inspire, innovate, and weave stories through our fabrics. Thanks, Brenda and Anna. Um, the work looks amazing. Uh, we were all just admiring it here in the studio while we were watching the video. And then finally, <laughs> and then finally, we have um, we have Mon from Luminaire Authentique. My name is Maud Rondeau, founder and designer of Luminaire Authentique. We offer custom lighting in a variety of options. So we have floor, standing, walls, cones, and then all of those are personalized in specific colors. Just recently, we just uh, introduced a new collection for Luminaire Authentique. Uh, we're really excited to uh, introduce a very minimalist, uh, I would say almost futurist collection in terms of uh, Lumière we can personalize our linear collection within our variety of colors. We want to offer a very unique product. So we want to offer an experience 
either for a commercial project or for residential. We are a local company, but we also want to make sure that every piece that we choose are made locally as well. We're really proud to have our local uh, collaborator and our local artisan that are around 30 kilometers around our workshop. Uh, so it makes us very proud to be able to say that we have very unique uh, personal design made here 100% in uh, Quebec. We just recently did a really cool collaboration with a local partnership where they do uh, terrazzo, uh, which is actually right here, a great example of a terrazzo uh, shade that they, uh, we developed with them. Uh, but the beauty of it is that we include parts within our current collection, which uh, respect the minimalist of our uh, design, but will introduce a really um, raw, uh, raw approach or raw uh, finish uh, within including a terrazzo uh, collection. This year, we decided to collaborate with a UK company, which the name is Tala. Uh, Tala developed a new technology in terms of a variety of color within the same bulbs. What is it exactly is that you can have a 2200K up to 3000K, which offer so many different offer, so many possibilities in terms of uh, atmosphere within the same lighting. New this year, we decide to collaborate with local artists. The concept is that we want local artists to be able to create their own collection. Uh, we want to have local artists to shine uh, in a different way. Uh, we want to open our doors of uh, thousands of possibilities. We want to have them to come here and to spend some time with us and to collaborate and design and put together a unique collection. Each year we'll have uh, open, uh, open to artists to submit their own project and we're going to select one artist to, uh, to shine within our collection. At Luna Antarctic, we're a colorful company. So what we want to offer is the infinite possibilities for you to customize your own lighting. We do have 54 colors for shades, and then we have infinite colors also for uh, glass balls, and then we can personalize also a texture. We can do a swell finish, uh, we can do a frosted or glossy, and uh, we can also offer a texture very interesting in to the pineapple finished into the glass bulb. To go back with the color, uh, we do have our own specific color that we did a very good research in to find the specific colors for the right time and the right in season uh, to be right in, uh, into the fashion design and design aspect. But we also include during the year seasonal colors and then we have specific collection that we can have special colors developed for unique and specific collection. And outside of that we also include a terrazzo collection which is uh, which was uh, very selected for to match our own color which is very authentic. And then to conclude uh, the infinite possibilities is that we also have a variety of color for wire to match the infinite possibilities in terms of color. Thanks, Matt. That was great. Um, cool to see that you're working with Tala, too. I really like that company. Um, so if there's one kind of common thread that I, in, each of the, in each of your videos and each of your practices, um, it's this idea of localism. You're all working with, um, uh, working with literally material that grew near your house um, or uh, craftspeople from uh, near where you are or manufacturing um, you know, close to your studios. And um, I wanted to kick off uh, the conversation with a discussion of you know, how you came to work with local collaborators and or how you came to work with your material, Ian. Um, and you know why that's an important part of your practice. And um, 
I guess uh, we can kick it off um, with the uh, with uh, Brenda and Anna. I'd love to know a little bit more about how you came to work with uh, people working in traditional weaving methods. Sure. Um, well, first of all, this is uh, like a recent new collaboration. We started actually when the pandemic hit, and it was because Aida texted us like, "Hey, I'm offering my services. Would you would you like to work with me?" And we were like, "Totally." So it, it is really an amazing opportunity to work with them. And besides, we're not at the same state. We, we do the communication that the process, it's really like we were sitting next to each other. So it's been an amazing journey working with them. And well, I think it's challenging because the distance, the communications, we never actually met face to face, but two months ago, actually we met finally. And I don't know, it's something amazing to work with them. Has working with them changed um, how you design your work or brought anything to your practice that has uh, helped to shape it since you started? Yes, I think it, it, it does. Because, I don't know, maybe you started doing your sketches and sometimes you put like in the physical part. But by doing by distance, we have like, okay, I'm going to explain, I have this idea, I'm going to be the most clear about it. And you start explaining her and she's like, okay, I get it. But what about, I think this material would work better. So it's a content feedback, the, this process of design. It's not just we have this idea and we execute it, but we have like, I have this idea, I talk to her, she tells me what she thinks about it, and it's, it's gonna work. And then we're like, okay, go for it. And actually the result is amazing because we started with something and finished with something totally different. Fantastic, and that's, it's pretty amazing that you've been able to develop that collaboration uh, remotely as well um, during the last year. I'm glad you finally met in person. So Mud, <laughs> yeah. I'd like to ask you the, the, same, uh, the same question. You know, was it ever a question of whether or not you would manufacture in Quebec? Um, and you know, how has the uh, various uh, industries there um, influenced uh, the way that you design your work? Well, to start, I think it's very uh, it's very important if you uh, tell uh, that you're a local company and you want to make uh, impact about like the ecological situation, but also uh, so many talents are here local, and I think it's by collaborate with local artisans with within their own expertise uh, and to like together we can grow and make more as a statement if we uh, if we pick and choose like local artisan like uh, glass blower like terrazzo I, I was talking about uh, and for me it's very important like uh, it's my per part of one of my personal values but it's it has to be in line with the way i do my manufacturing and i'm very proud that all 100% 100% of our material becomes are around 30 kilometers from our workshop. That's great. And um, you, you gave the example of the terrazzo maker um, that you ended up working with um, to create a lamp. Can you give a, another example or two of um, times when you've found a local maker and you're like, yeah, I really have to work with that person and it you know, influenced the generation of a design? Uh, definitely the glass floor. Uh, the glass floor, it's incredible. When I step in into their studio, uh, it's Wellmo. Uh, and when I stepped in in their studio and I found this artistic, uh, artistic way of working the glass and everything is like handmade and you feel that you're like back in like 100 years ago, like it's super hot and sweaty and it's like, it's, it's, all like it's so technical it's so impressive like the amount of hours and sweat that are in one little piece and uh for me it's important to be very transparent and i want more and more showcase about who what what is the work behind 
the lampshade looks like it looks like maybe exactly the same that it's from China, but like what is make difference from like who worked behind the human behind the pieces? I think it's very important. For sure, and um, yeah, glass blowing is always. I'm terrible at it. I've tried it like twice, and it's um, <laughs> and it is uh, it, it it is sweaty and challenging. Um, so, yeah. um, so Ian, you don't exactly speak of sweaty and challenging. <laughs> there, Ian, um, you don't exactly. Uh, so, I mean, you work with hyper local material. A lot of it is from you know very very close to um, where you are out on Long Island. How did you start doing that? How did you start? Um, uh, taking this uh, wood that you've kind of just found around and um, turning it into uh, furnishings that really kind of speak to their origins. I mean, I'm not trained in any way, and uh, so I've only been doing this a couple of years, but it started with like a, a guy that was um, coming to my house, taking care of some stuff in my house, and he also sold firewood, and he's seeing me build a couple things around the house, just like fixing stuff. He just dropped off all these like chunks of raw wood one day and it was like what do you do with this so I kind of held on to it and and um, eventually just kind of fell in love with like the abstractness of creating something out of these pieces and and uh, so now I've it's become really what I do the most you know and so I have a couple arborists that I go to and my chainsaw in the car and cut the logs up and um, you know it's in Long Island so you're constantly hearing people cutting down trees so it's like all right, where's that sound coming from? And you look, it's like, whoa, can I have that? Like, sure. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, that's kind of, it's uh, how I kind of started with it. Yeah, and uh, you know, you mentioned in the video, people are usually happy to give it up. Oh um, my God, so happy, yeah. So in terms of the form of the work, is that derived in the moment from the material or is that something that you have a preconceived, oh, I really need to find a, log that mm. can be turned into X, Y, or Z design? I mean, initially, it's totally like intuitive based, and it's, uh, it's kind of like, you know, design, I, I, from what I hear, mostly people have a design, and then they find the material that works with the design. For me, it's like the materials designating how, what's coming out of it. But now I've made a good amount of them that people are asking for, can you make this shape again, that shape again, so I can sort of look for pieces. You know, some of them have this animalistic quality, so there's, certain little parts of the way the trees grow that I can see in it that I can make into a little leg that looks weird or funny or whatever. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I'm, that's a, yeah, I'm always kind of fascinated by whether you're kind of uh, just carving away until you get what you want or replic or uh, you know, seeking out that. the perfect yeah, material. Kind of that. <laughs> well, I'd like to ask everyone else about you know, their origin stories as well. Like Brenda and Paula, how did you start working together and what's the collaboration like? I, it, does one of you handle one aspect of the design and another handle a different one? What's the back and forth like? Well, I would start by saying we, we met at the university. We had uh, the same classes. We are from the same generation. And we started working in a lot of projects together. And I think it was like our last year we said, so do you want to do something? Should we start our business? We were still studying at the moment. Um, and for us, it was very a very difficult decision because we said, OK, we are, we are graduating. Should we? do something else? Should we search for another job? Are we going to stay together? Um, and in the end, we said, let's do it. Uh, let's give it our all and let's start a business. And I would say it's the same maybe as Ian said, like the opportunities just came around. Some things just come and we didn't plan it. For instance, with AIDA, um, the different products that we've been doing, maybe we started doing uh, like wall hangings and then we said, what would happen if we tried the same, but with pillows? And what would happen if we contact an artisan, uh, people from Mexico City, not only from Oaxaca? So I would say, as of now, we tend to divide uh, the different aspects of the business, uh, given what, what works best. But at the beginning, it was all hands in. We started doing everything together. It was just a matter of really finding a balance when you actually have no idea how to run a business. No, I would say, that was the biggest challenge, but it's been very, very satisfactory to say how can we achieve so much at this moment and looking back how we started, I would say it's just a matter of challenging yourself, but also trying to see which works best. No, not everyone can do the same things. It's easier when you delegate. It's everyone has something they're better at than the other, and it's not something you should try to 
hard, no? It's something you need to do all of yourself. It's it's like a teamwork, and it's the way it works best. Do you each bring a different kind of creative ingredient into the mix? Like, uh... yeah, <laughs> I think we have the same aesthetic, even though we have different ideas when it comes to design. What we normally do is, okay, let's choose a theme for both of us, but then each of us is gonna work on their own sketches, their own uh, color palette, and whatever. And at the end, then we come together and we see which which things uh, work, which are actually not that great. So we give each other feedback, and then we start again and again and again until we arrive at the end of the of the new collection. And that's when we say, okay, this works for me. Does it work for you? It does. Then we move ahead. Is there um, a Brenda component and an Anna component um, when you're sketching separately? Do you have a different sense of uh, what you want to make? And if so, how know. would you describe it? <laughs> I, think I would say, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I think it's, <laughs> it's a mix and mix and match. Sometimes it has tons of Anna essence, and other parts it like I have the colors. But it, it's, it's continued like, why, what do you say? Oh, I like that. OK, go ahead. You go ahead. And that's the process. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Mon, how did you get your start? Uh, your start designing. I well, um, I come totally from a different world. So very quickly uh, from sales and marketing, and uh, I had to a point that I was just uh, unhappy and I wanted to do my own project. And I noticed on the market that there was no, there was no uh, custom lighting accessible uh, where kind of very, very uh, platform uh, playful uh, for architects, designer, uh, for uh, residential. So I started actually in my garage six years ago and uh, very fast uh, the company growth and right now we're 35 employees. Uh, we have three stores and uh, yeah, a big manufacturing uh, of 20,000 square foot. So it was, uh, it was a quite a, a fast track uh, growing. But uh, yeah, it, it, that's how it started. What was the first piece? The first piece was actually, uh, it was actually made in um, concrete in my basement. So that was the, the actual first piece. And then, uh, and then after that, we, uh, we developed, uh, it was kind of more uh, outdoor, uh, very barn looking style and then as of this, we developed like the, a totally more aesthetic for like uh, modern and Scandinavian, and yeah, it just continued to grow and bring up some new colors and some new shape and some new uh, construction and material also. So we're always looking for new materials to include, uh, which are very specific to each designer or artisan that we're gonna pick and choose here locally. Now, with such a range of um, sort of form and materials, um, there's still kind of I don't know a family resemblance among all of the different uh, all of the different work. Uh, how do you describe the sensibility that runs through it all? Um, you know, if you could sum up the, a, a common aesthetic, um, what would you, what would it be? It's. Uh... There's always a feminine touch. I don't know why, <laughs> but it, there's always a feminine aspect of like, it's very, it needs to be clean, minimalist. Uh, it's lighting, it's, a, it's what makes the whole ambience. So it needs to be soft. It needs to be blended in the home decor. So even though if we do like totally different type of um, texture or uh, form, like you said, uh, I would say the minimalist and the Scandinavian aspect of it will is always has an influence in the either in the color finish, either in the way of like the the line or the design or the com, combination. Um, yeah, except for this collection that uh, I talked a bit a little bit about the residence uh, with the local artist. And this is like totally uh, a new capsule for Luminar Authentic. Uh, so we did a collaboration with Jimmy Le Le Chatelier. Uh, he's a local uh, artist uh, and he came up, we met uh, in December. And 
his work is really to give back a second life to an on uh, on like some some pieces that are found on the street or in the trash or it could be it's mostly um, uh, and then like yeah garbage <laughs> <laughs> most is and then it, it was to combine like the beauty and the aesthetic and the softness of luminaire authentique within is fine and cultural aspect of it so i'm very proud of uh this new collaboration we just did that's very cool and speaking of found material ian um <laughs> i mean is there uh, is there a way? Is there a thread that runs through your work that you think is uh, that you you know? If you were to talk about the sort of guiding aesthetic that runs through it all, um, how would you describe it? I mean, I think for whatever reason, I'm drawn to material that uh, is somehow going to be uh, thrown away or unused in some way, and I just collect and I collect, and then. I, for me, I just I wait until I see it in the material, and then. Um, just start working on it, it kind of presents itself. So it's this like kind of synergy with, with the material I'm working with and intuition based. And um, it's, you know, sculpture, I've never really done sculpture. So it's very, uh, there's this kind of real raw primitive aspect to it that I just, I love. Yeah, there's a sense of play to it that I really, is, really like. Yeah. Um, that that kind of comes through whether you're doing a, whether you're making a, rather practical like desk, practical if large desk yeah. um, for a commission or um, you know a simple uh, stool or something like that. Yeah, there's, I there's definitely, some whimsy to it. Yeah, I definitely embrace like any mistake that happens and go with that and not try to fix it or mm -hmm. cover it up too much and kind of let it go its own a new direction, you know, which can be usually the most unique pieces, you know, and special I think. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask the same question for Paula and Brenda, um, or sorry, for Brenda and Anna. Um, the, uh, you know, if you could describe a common look, a common uh, aesthetic uh, that runs through all of the textiles that you're creating, you know, how, how do you tell people about it? Well, I think we both agree that our textiles, we want them to be traditional by respecting the traditional weaving techniques, but giving a contemporary twist. So we look forward that our cushion on our artwork would be in as, as anyone who appreciates the technique. Also, we make like this twist with the colors and new materials we work with. So I think that that will be. <laughs> How has starting to work with um, outside weavers sort of changed the way that you think about a project? Um, you know, you said it was just the two of you, and then you've developed this collaborative back and forth. Um, you know, this uh, has been a crazy year for everyone. We've all, you know, had to pivot and change and adapt. And as your capacity to produce has gotten gotten larger, you know, what has changed about the company, and where do you kind of, what aspects of that do you think uh, will stick around into the future? Well, uh, it go, please answer, Anne. I'm sorry. I was thinking <laughs> on that point, actually. Um, I would say people normally think that stuff happens on demand. No? Like, I want a question, then you have it. And I, I think this new collaboration, uh, working with Aida and her husband, it's really about the process itself. Like, you know you cannot have something that magically appeared in a FedEx box and it's now at home, right? For us, it's more about, even if we have more capacity, it still takes so much time to make each piece, no? and each design to be exactly as it's on the, maybe on the design that we passed Aida, or she may say, you know, this is impossible to do for me, or this is gonna take longer. And I think that's something that, that we've really come to appreciate uh, at now. Like, we, we see our pieces, and we, we know how much it actually took. So. I think what we have now tried to do more is not try to overexploit these new capacities that we have, but rather give it a sense of this took hours. This this pillow was made especially for you. We dyed the colors just the color that we wanted it since the beginning. Every thread, every piece of wool that's made, it's especially for that piece alone. So I think that's something that really changed the way we used to see uh, textile products.
that's really important to keep in mind. You know, even though you've um, added this manufacturing capacity or this making capacity, um, it's still uh, a process that takes time. It takes you know someone's hand. It takes uh, you know this uh, weaving expertise. And Matt, I wanted to ask. Yeah, definitely. A, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, yeah, definitely. It, it takes a lot, and people really need to start appreciating the process behind each piece, and not just think it's something made out of a fabric that it's actually not personalized or so special for you. And uh, Maud, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, similarly, your company has grown significantly over the, the last uh, little bit. Um, what are some of the changes that have happened with the design over that time, or how has uh, the work evolved alongside uh, your ability to produce it? Uh, it's been a challenge, uh, definitely, because like uh, like any other handmade product, like there's no automatization, there's no, uh, it's human. So it kind of like to gauge the, the amount of uh, the production, uh, yes, we continue to grow the, the team, but it has, there's the training aspect and um, like everything has to go in the same level. So sales, uh, workshop, and design teams, that, because we do 360, so we do our own design, we do the, the fabrication, and then we do the distribution. This is how we're capable of offering a very accessible product uh, and uh, custom. But uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been challenging, especially the, the last year. Uh, but I think the positive out of it is really that people now understand the value of an artist or a production. I don't know, I think maybe the, the world stopped a little bit and then we kind of like realize how important it is and has an impact to, to, uh, to influence or to buy a product or to, to buy a local artist product. And I think it's, uh, everyone that kind of opened their book and opened the how they do and they they respect and they're not are, we're not trying to do faster like we don't want to cut in the quality we don't want to cut like yes we can grow but there's a time to to grow uh, so yeah it's it's challenging because right now our delay keep keeps like extending but we keep growing but it's kind of like trying to find the balance and balance in your personal life as well. So you don't want to do seven to seven, 24, 24. Like we, we, we all have like a, a lifetime, <laughs> not work only. <laughs> It's true. It's been it's been a, a challenge for some of us to uh, turn off in the last uh, in the last year or so. But um, it, it, it's uh, you know to the point of you know this, this work doesn't just show up in a box on your doorstep one day. You know there is a uh, a real process and often a process that can't be rushed uh, behind it. Um, Ian, I wanted to ask you. You know how is um, how is how is doing uh, kind of individual works different from some of the bigger commissions that you've been taking taking on? Um, you know, do you like working with clients? What's the? <laughs> I love it. I mean, yeah. I mean, when they when they hire me to make things, it's usually because I make these specific things. Mm -hmm. so I, you know, they I, I think they're gonna like it, but um, yeah. I mean, there's nothing like making something so unique and custom, and then having them just absolutely love it, whether it's for somebody's house or for you know a big office or whatever it is. It's you can really feel like this connection with the material and the, and the product that you give them. So it's, it's great, it makes it all worth it. Do you have to be judicious about the commissions you take on? I mean, do you have to really like the context where the work is going? I mean, or can you pretty much, you know, can... I mean, there's things I just, I'm not great at. Like, I'm not great at making like traditional, you know, cabinetry things or something. So I just don't, I won't do it. But if it's in my wheelhouse and it's like that, then, then I'm happy to do it. And that's where I kind of like thrive in, in what I do. Cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, and it's a really interesting range of people mm -hmm. that you've worked with, too. So a lot of different adaptations of uh, the work. Well, we need to wind things down, um, but I wanted to uh, take a minute to thank everyone for joining us and uh, to thank Anna and Brenda and Maude and Ian for, um, for uh, taking part in the discussion. And um, we'll be back with the second installment of our North American Studios discussions uh, very soon. Thanks, everyone. 
Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.